welcome to our third week of our Behind the Scenes series. This is a uh, children's ministry sync series we're in in the month of July, which means that we are syncing up our message series with what our children's ministry, which is birth through fifth grade, uh, is doing because we want to invest in the future. At this church, we invest in kids and students because kingdom-minded kids and students change the world. And so we're going to sacrifice things that we love for things that we love more so that everyone can connect with God right where they are. So this week and next week, we'll continue discussing with our children's ministry what is happening behind the scenes in the book of Esther. Now, it's also a Bible book study, uh, which we do twice a year. So we've got some extra resources like Kelly spoke about at the beginning uh, for you to help dive deep into the book of Esther. So if you've not yet picked up one of these introductory study guides, we have more of them located at the resource hub. Uh, and we also have <coughs> the last two weeks of these behind the scenes devotional guides. Now, I know we ran out, even though I print, printed more this week than I did the week before. We still ran out of these. Uh, so I've got some printing. I've got more at the front door and at the resource hub. We've also dropped both of those resources in the Church Center app for your convenience. So if you are looking for them, you can always download them from there. But I do have more printing from week three, and there's also, I believe, at the Resource Hub, some of week two's devotional guide as well. Uh, I also want to apologize that we only made it through Esther 4 last week. We were supposed to make it through Esther 5, but we only made it through Esther 4. So I'm going to quickly summarize Esther 5 today before we get into this block of Esther 6 through 8. Now, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to the book of Esther. Esther is an Old Testament book, <coughs> right around Ezra and Nehemiah. And we're going to be starting in Esther 5 today, so you're looking for a big number 5. Uh, and we're going to try to make it through the first part of 8 today. So, in Esther 5, we see that Esther is actually at the end of her three-day fast. Remember, she told Mordecai, to go have all the Jewish people fast for three days. She and her woman would, women would also fast for three days. And so we see as Esther 5 opens that Esther is at the end of that three-day fast, getting ready to go before the king on Mordecai's instructions. But I want you to notice something before we read Esther 5.1, something that is said all the way back in Esther 4.11. It says this, I, this is Esther speaking, I have not been called to come to the king these 30 days. Okay, so that means the queen has not seen the king in 30 days. And we know that the queen and king are married, so we can assume that for the last 30 days, the king has been entertaining other women. And that makes what Esther is about to do even more dangerous. Okay, so Esther 5, verse, starting in verse 1, it says this. <clears throat> on the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace in front of the king's quarters. While the king was sitting on his royal throne inside the throne room, opposite the entrance to the palace. And when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she won favor in his sight, and he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. And then Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter, and the king said to her, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given you even to half of my kingdom. And Esther said, If it pleases the king, let the king and Haman come today to a feast that I have prepared for the king. And then the king said, Bring Haman quickly, so that we may do as Esther has asked. So the king and Haman came to the feast that Esther had prepared. So not only is the king excited to see her, he wants to see her, he actually offers her anything that she asked for, even up to half his kingdom. Oddly, Esther decides to invite the king and Haman to a banquet. And if you're counting, it's the sixth banquet so far in this book. So if you're looking for a reason to throw a party, read the book of Esther, okay? Because there's a lot of banquets happening in it, all right? So this is the sixth banquet so far. And even though Esther hasn't eaten in three days, remember she's been fasting, she prepares a meal for the king and his right-hand man. And again, at the meal, the king asked her, hey, what do you want? And he offers her this time a wish and a request. It says this in verse 6, as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king said to Esther, what is your wish? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. So this seems like the prime time 
to spill the beans on what's going on with Haman. See, the king's belly is full, the wine is flowing, and we've already seen that the king can't exactly hold his liquor well. And so Esther invites the king and queen, or the king and Haman to another feast, which seems odd, but Esther clearly has a plan. More importantly, so does God. So Haman stumbles out of the banquet, drunk as a skunk, very proud that he has once again been invited to dine with the king and queen. But that doesn't last long. It says this in verse 9, And Haman went out that day joyful and glad of heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he neither rose nor trembled before him, he was filled with wrath against Mordecai. Now remember, Mordecai has been in mourning, in sackcloth. He can't come to the king's gate because you can't do that when you're in sackcloth. So obviously, after the fast, Mordecai puts back on regular clothes and is now seated at the king's gate in his position. And Haman comes by, and once again, Mordecai refuses to pay homage to him. See, it doesn't take long for a prideful person to find something to upset them. So what does Haman do? He calls all of his friends and family together to brag about how great he is, but even that can't calm his anger. It says this in verse 13, Yet all this is worth nothing to me so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. And this section of scripture should remind us just how foolish Haman is. It makes you wonder how a guy like this got so much power. But fear not, Haman's wife and all of his friends have a great solution to the Mordecai problem. It says this in verse 14. Then his wife, Zeresh, and all his friends said to him, Let a gallows 50, feet, 50 cubits high be made, and in the morning tell the king to have Mordecai hanged on it. Then go joyfully with the king to the feast. And this idea pleased Haman, and he had the gallows made. Now, when we hear the word gallows, we think a hangman's noose, right? That didn't get invented till centuries later. So what they're actually talking about is a 75-foot-tall spike that they want to impale Mordecai on. Okay, so the book of Esther's got lots of parties and some very graphic details about death in it. <coughs> so Esther puts off telling her secret to the king in the first party, and it seems like that was a mistake because things keep getting worse. On the other hand, Haman is very confident that he will finally be done with Mordecai, and so he has his servants work all night long to build this 75-foot-tall stake in his backyard. And at this point in the story, you would think this is the point when God's going to show up, right? God's going to come in and crush Haman, and it's going to be great. See, Esther is finally brave enough to go to the king, but God doesn't show up in the way that we think he would. And Esther puts off telling the king, and the situation went from bad to worse. And we can learn from this situation up to this point that sometimes bad things happen to us, that we just don't understand, right? Sometimes we even think that we see the solution in front of us, but things are actually worse than we thought. Like Esther and Mordecai, we don't understand why God allows the things that he allows. I mean, at this point in the story, we don't really see the hand of God. It seems like Haman has more control over the fate of God's people than God does, and the only people who are actually working for good are sound asleep and don't even know what's happening. And as night falls in chapter 5, we expect the morning to begin in chapter 6, but we actually find it's still nighttime in the palace, and the king has a problem. Starting in verse 1, it says, On that night the king could not sleep, and he gave orders to bring the book of memorable deeds, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written how Mordecai had told about Bigtha and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold, who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And the king said, What honor or distinction has been, has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the king's young men who attended him said, Nothing has been done for him. So the king can't sleep, and he asks for this book of memorable deeds to be read to him. And you might be thinking, this is going to be some riveting reading, you know, some King Arthur-type stuff. But it's not. It's more like spreadsheets, 
with dates and events and names and outcomes. And maybe that's why the king wanted it read to him. I know a good spreadsheet puts me right to sleep, right? But the king's servants just so happened, by coincidence, of course, to be reading the account of Mordecai saving the king's life. And as Haman is happily on his way, skipping to the king's palace to ask permission to kill Mordecai, we have the king's servants reading this story about how Mordecai saved the king. And that fact that nothing has been done for Mordecai would have been shocking to the king because Persian kings were famously generous for rewarding people for their service. So let's keep reading. And then the king said, who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered into the outer court and the king's palace to speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for him. And the king's young men told him, well, Haman is there standing in the court. And the king said, let him come in. So Haman came in. The king said, what should be done to the man who the king delights to honor? And Haman smiles. You know, like in the Grinch movie, when the Grinch smiles... That's what I picture Haman doing here, right? Haman says to him, Well, whom would the king delight to honor more than me? And so Haman says to the king, For the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden on, whose head a royal crown is set. And let the robes and the horse be handed over to the one of the king's most noble officials. And let him dress the man whom the king delights to honor, and let them be led on the horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Right? So Haman is excitedly skipping over to the king's palace to finally kill Mordecai, and the king is equally excited that Haman just so happens by coincidence to be in the court, because he's not exactly sure how he's going to reward Mordecai. And so Haman comes in to the king, focused on revenge, and is shocked when the king wants to honor someone. And since the king never mentions Mordecai's name, he most certainly is talking about Haman, right? It's a dream come true. And Haman is in la-la land, telling the king of all these great things that he should do for him, to honor him. And in this daydream, we actually see Haman's true motive. See, wearing clothing that belongs to the king is actually asking for kingship, okay? The king's horse, whose royal crown or crest was sitting on, is considered the king's movable throne. No one but the king could use his scepter or his horse. So Haman is clearly trying to take power from the king here. But listen to the king's response to Haman's daydream. The king says to Haman, hurry and take the robes and the horse just as you've said and do it for Mordecai the Jew who sits at the king's gate and leave nothing out that you have mentioned. So Haman took the robes and the horse. He dresses Mordecai, leads him through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Hmm. Haman spent all night anxiously waiting to shame Mordecai before the entire city by impaling him on a 75-foot tall spike. And instead, he sees his enemy receive the honor that he thinks he deserves, the one he's been working his whole life for. And even worse, he's the guy leading Mordecai around the city, shouting, shouting this proclamation, this is the man the king wants to honor. Interesting. And Esther 6 closes like this. Mordecai returns to the king's gate, but Haman hurried to his house, mourning and with his head covered. And Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened. Then his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you've begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. While they were yet talking, the king's eunuchs then arrive and hurry to bring Haman to the feast that Esther has prepared. What an incredible reversal of fortune. God had a plan and was patiently working on it for a long time. We talked about this last week. There are no coincidences at all. Okay, Coincidences are not a thing. 
It's actually God's providence. But what we often look for is God to intervene into our situations in a supernatural way. And God can do that even today. God is still in the miracle working business. But what we often don't realize, what we are often unable to understand or believe is that is what God did here for Mordecai. See, God is so powerful that he's able to save Mordecai with ever, without ever resulting to the supernatural. And if you look at all of these events in Esther so far as single events, there's nothing really strange or unusual about it. It's just people exercising their free will. It's people who are doing whatever they want to do to get as much power and control as they want so they can rule over other people. There's nothing really strange about it. But when you put them all together, you cannot help but see that something is happening here behind the scenes. I mean, look at it. Haman builds the gallows, right? Goes into the king, excited to see the king. The king just so happens to be awake that night, unable to sleep. His servants just so happen to turn to the account of Mordecai. Mordecai just so happened four years ago to not receive a reward for saving the king's life. Haman just so happens to be in the court when the king needs someone to tell him how to honor Mordecai. Haman just so happens to be the guy who's got to honor Mordecai, right? All of this, you could say, okay, you know, all by itself could be maybe just, you know, happen chance, right? But there's not any coincidences. God has been working out these plans, right? God is the hero of the book of Esther, even though he does all of his work behind the scenes. God is the one who's been orchestrating these events from the very beginning without ever removing man's free will. Each character in the book did whatever they wanted to do, yet God was still able to orchestrate it all in order to fulfill his purpose. Look what happens next in Esther chapter 7, verse 1 through 5. <coughs> so the king and Haman went to a feast with Queen Esther. And on the second day, as they're drinking wine after the feast, the king again says to Esther, What is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Even to half of my kingdom it shall be fulfilled. And Esther answers, If I found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be granted for my wish and my people for my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. And if we've been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would, have not, I would have been silent. For our affliction would not be compared to the loss to the king. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, Who is he? Where is he? Who would dare to do this? See, for five years, Esther has quietly kept her secret about being Jewish. From the king. But this day, at yet another banquet, she finally tells him. Now, you might not fully understand the seriousness of what is happening here. Esther is asking the king for a really big favor. In fact, there's another guy, the king Ahasuerus, asked, was asked for a favor. History tells us about a man who gave the king a very large sum of money in order to help him fight the Greeks. And this man had the king over for dinner, much like Esther many times before. And this man had five sons, all of who were in the army. And of course, the king is preparing for war. And this man wanted to make sure that his family's name would survive. And so he asked the king to release his oldest son from service so that he could keep the family name going. And is all of this too much to ask the king? I mean, this man has done so much for the king. He's given him money to fight the Greeks. He's had him over for dinner. Is this too much to ask? And so how do you think King Ahasuerus decided to answer this man? Well, the king decided, I'm going to take the man's oldest son, you know, the one the man wanted to be released, and cut him in half with a sword. And then... The king, just to prove his point, puts the two halves of this young boy's body and has his army walk between them. 
just to prove a point to this man. This is the kind of man that Queen Esther is married to. This is the man that she's asking a favor from. But here's the thing that Esther remembered, and we would be good, we would do well to remember this as well. God has made some amazing promises to his people. In Exodus 6, 7, God said, I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. In fact, in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, God says to Abram, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred, your father's house, to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse, and all your families of the earth shall be blessed. So because Esther believed these promises, she was willing to align herself with God's people and cling to these promises. See, God has made the same promises to you and more. The thing we often forget when we're going through a period of darkness is that God is still in control. And God always keeps his promises. Now, it might not always be on our time frame, but he always does. And I always say, man, I wish God would just get on my timeline. But I am so thankful he doesn't. Because there has been so many periods in my life when I've walked through darkness, and I've been like, God, I don't know how to get out of this. I don't know what you're doing. I don't understand. And I can look back at those seasons of life Say, man, God was in control. God was doing stuff behind the scenes I didn't even understand. I didn't see it in the moment. But I can look back and know. And if you're a born-again believer, God has made a promise to you in Romans 8, 26 through 28. He says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes with us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. That means we, as born-again believers, have the Holy Spirit living inside of us to help us when we're weak when we don't know what to do, when we don't know where to go, when we don't know what to say, when we don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit is interceding for us. That means the Spirit of God is living inside of you, praying for you, speaking to the Father for you with groanings that are too deep even for words. And even when the road looks like hell, we can trust, we can know that God is going to work this out. Somehow, some way, for our good. That is the trust that Esther has in God when she stands before the king to ask him for a favor. And when he finds out, he's shocked and he's furious. And notice that Esther does that intentionally, right? The king is angry before he even knows who to be angry at. And Esther responds to the king, Esther says, a foe, an enemy, this wicked Haman. And Haman was terrified before the king and queen. And the king arose in his wrath from the wine drinking and went into the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that harm was determined against him by the king. The king is ticked. And he storms out into the garden, and here is Haman... Bowing before a Jew, begging for his life. <clears throat> and in this, Haman makes a prideful mistake. And I hope that you can see all throughout this story about Haman that pride will always lead to your downfall. The higher the pride, the harder you'll fall. And Haman makes a horrible mistake when he decides to beg for his life from the queen. See, in Persian culture, to even approach a royal concubine or wife, even by accident, is a death sentence. 
It's actually against harem protocol for a man to be within seven steps of the queen or even to speak to her without the king present. So look at how the king interprets the situation as he walks back into the room. The king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. And the Haman says, or and the king says, will he even assault the queen in my presence in my own house? And as the word left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. Death was coming. Now, whether the king finally put everything together, Haman's trying to kill his wife. He wants the royal robes, the signet ring, the royal parade with the movable throne. I don't know. But it's clear the king is done. And then, you know, of course, by coincidence, here comes Harbana. One of the king's eunuchs in attendance says, Moreover, the gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, you know, the one whose word saved the king, standing at Haman's house, 50 cubits high. King says, hang Haman on it. So they hang Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai, and the wrath of the king is abated. Brings us to Esther 8. And I just want to touch on Esther 8 to set up for next week as we finish up this series. Esther 8, 1 through 3 says, On that day, King Ahasuerus gave to Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was to her. The king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther sent Mordecai over the house of Haman. Esther spoke again to the king. Felling, she fell at his feet, wept, and pleaded with him to avert the evil plan of Haman the Agai and the plot that he had devised against the Jews. <clears throat> See, that edict was still out there. The Jews were still set for annihilation. Just because Haman is gone doesn't mean that has been rescinded. And so we'll have to wait till next week to see what the king says. But as we move into our time of response, I want you to see this great reversal that has taken place. Haman is impaled on the very stake that he built in his own backyard to kill Mordecai. And Esther risked her life in order to save herself and her people in an even greater way. Jesus gave his life in order to save his enemies. Like Esther, he left his throne and he identified himself with his own people, but we rejected him. We actually called for his crucifixion. And can you imagine the anger of God in that moment? I'm sure it was far greater than the anger of King Ahasuerus as he walked back in the room and saw Haman with his wife. But how does Jesus respond in that moment? With mercy, Jesus says, Father, forgive them. See, in spite of our sin, Jesus forgave us. And he's offering that to you today. If you've not yet accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've not yet received His forgiveness today, I want to invite you as we continue in worship day today to come and speak to someone who's wearing a blue or red lanyard. They would love to speak to you about what it means to follow Jesus Christ. But we also see in the book of Esther, today's passage especially, that God is working behind the scenes. <clears throat> so I want to invite you. If you feel like you're walking in darkness today. If your life feels like hell on earth. If you're struggling to understand why God would allow whatever it is that's happening in your life to happen. If you're struggling to understand where God is in this darkness. If it feels like the weight of the world is crushing you and you're crying out to God saying, why? Why, God? If you're struggling to see God's moving in your life, I want you to know that He is. You might not understand it, 
Life might be really hard right now. But we can learn from Esther that even at the face of death, God is working behind the scenes. God is doing stuff that we don't even understand. We can't see it in the moment. When we're in darkness, all we see around us is darkness. All we see and feel around us is pain. Maybe that's what you're going through right now. I want you to know that God is faithful. God will keep his promises. And it's going to be hard. But you've got to trust. See, Esther and Mordecai were not following God. But they were raised as Jews. So they understood God's promises for his people. And maybe you're not following God right now. Maybe you've walked away. Maybe life has been so hard that you're done with God today. But I want you to know that if that's how you feel, God is still in control. And God has promises for you. If you're a born-again believer, the Holy Spirit is praying on your behalf. How overwhelming to know that the Spirit of God is inside of me when I'm struggling to see the next step in life. The Holy Spirit is praying to the Father on my behalf. That's overwhelming to think about. But that is our God. And so I want to invite you, if you're struggling today, if life is hard today, I want to invite you to come. And let us pray with you. Let us wrap our arms around you. We're not God, but we can be his instrument today. I'll even give you a hug if that's what you need. Because I want you to understand, because I've been through a lot of darkness in my life. I want you to understand that you can trust God is still in control. You can trust that he'll be faithful. And it might be darkness for a while. But we'll walk with you. We'll walk with you in the darkness. When you're struggling to walk, we'll pick you up and carry you if it takes. That's what it takes. Because God is still with you in the darkness. God is still moving. God is still in control. God can still turn it around. Because God is working behind the scenes. That's the invitation today. The invitation is for you to come and Just trust God. Just trust that he'll be faithful. God, I'm grateful for the story of Esther. The testimony that you are faithful, that you keep your promises even when we can't understand, even when we can't see what's happening, even when it doesn't feel like the darkness will ever end, that you are still faithful. That you are still in control. That as your child, you are working things out for our good. And we might go through a season of pain. Life might be hard for a while. But you're going to get us through it, God. You're going to walk with us in the darkness. And so, God, I know there are people in the room. I know there are people who are watching online who are struggling to understand why this is happening in their life. And I don't have the answer. But I know in spite of whatever it is, that you are still in control. That you care about us so much that you would send your son to die for us, even though we rejected him. That you love us enough to die in our place. That you love us enough to walk in darkness with us, to carry us through that you love us enough to put us together in this room, in this place, as a family, as your family, to be able to walk alongside each other, God, to help carry the burden of one another in the darkness. And so, God, I pray as we continue to worship you, that if there are those struggling, that you will bring them to us so we can love them and pray with them and walk with them in the darkness. 
pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.